Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Java, Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. Get ready, the show's about to begin. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. This is episode 139 or season three, episode 35. And if this is your first time joining the show, I am the incredible Jeff. And I'd love it if you took a second and followed everything I get to do here at Fueled by Deathcast. It's really easy across all social media at Fueled by Deathcast. And also, make sure to subscribe to the show. If you're listening to this show on iTunes, hit that subscribe button or Spotify, Stitcher, Google Music, iHeartRadio, or in full video on the Death Wish Coffee Company YouTube page, make sure you hit that subscribe button because you'll be notified when all of our new episodes and new stuff come out every single week. And this show would be absolutely nothing without the voice of death himself, Brock Powell. Brock Powell is the voice actor on this show and a thousand voices out there in the world. Go follow Brock across all social media at BrockVox or at BrockVox.com. Follow his journey because he gets to do some really incredible stuff in the voice acting industry. And it's really fun to just see where he's going and where he's been. Secret code unlocked. Discount of death. You heard the voice of death right there. As a fan and listener or viewer of Fueled by Deathcast, you get a secret discount code that's not so secret. It is all one word, discount of Jeff. Type that in at checkout at deathwishcoffee.com for 12% off your purchase. And that is for our coffee, for our various merchandise, for our mugs, whatever you happen to see on that website. Put it all in your cart, and at checkout, make sure you use the code Discount of Jeff for 12% off your entire purchase. This week, I am very excited and honored to bring Dr. Stephen Humphreys to the episode. Um, Dr. Stephen Humphreys actually stopped into the studio to talk about archaeology and his passion and drive for doing so. Him and his team of American Veterans Archaeological um, Recovery, AVAR, were actually right in our backyard at the Saratoga Battlefield, the famous site which was the turning point of the Revolutionary War. And um, they were excavating a site that had never been excavated before, looking for some really, really interesting stuff. And they invited us out to the archaeological dig, we actually got to get our hands dirty, which was really cool. And I brought Dr. Humphreys back here, and we talked about what it was like to start an organization like this, which is literally, it is promoting the well-being of disabled veterans transitioning from is transitioning into civilian life through field archaeology. What's incredible is is that archaeology has a lot of meticulous stuff that goes into it, a lot of hard work, and a lot of teamwork. And all of those things are tenants of people who have been in service. And so it is a great way to kind of reacclimate and also maybe find something that they never thought they really liked and be able to kind of rise in the ranks of archaeology, which we talk about as well. It's so interesting to talk to Dr. Humphreys about his passion for this project and the good that he's bringing to the world because of something like AVAR. So mugs up this week for this week's death guest, Dr. Stephen Humphreys. The Fueled by Death Guest. Thank you so much for coming here and not only coming and talking with me on the podcast, but inviting me out to the dig with, with the team here at Death Wish. That was, that was one of the most fun things I've ever done. I'm just glad you got to actually get on the metal detector a little bit. That yeah. was really cool. Like, I found a thing. You I, found a thing. I, I don't know what it is. You guys probably, it was probably a nail. Let's, let's, let's be honest. It was no, probably it a nail. No, it could have It was a nail. It was um, a nail. But yeah, I think the coolest thing for us is to kind of see new people come out and get on the equipment and see how much fun digging is, because yeah. that's why we do this. So I, yeah, thanks for coming out. I can 
uh, understand how people get into archaeology be, just from being there for a couple minutes. I was like, oh my god, I'm Indiana Jones, and I'm going to do this forever. Like, yeah, it's I addictive. Just... And like, I had never metal detected before this project. This mm. is a new thing oh, for wow. the world of archaeology. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of a new methodology. So the guys would go out there and they'd get hooked on like, oh, I hear the beep, I hear the beep. And I didn't really understand it until I tried it. And then I was like, wow, the beep is fucking addictive. It really like, is. They live for that beep. So it, yeah, I'm glad you got to, I'm glad you got to get the rush. It's so cool. And I want to like actually start there because this is exactly what you guys just started doing um, with AVAR. You guys are in our backyard at the Saratoga Battlefield. And I want you to talk a little bit about that because I learned that you're the first people to excavate that battlefield? Yeah, so this is a really neat collaboration. Like basically a year ago, we came up with this idea to put veterans on this specific battlefield. We've been working with the Park Service and the American Battlefield Trust since then in order to kind of make this come together. But this site is the turning point of the Revolutionary War. Mm. This is where America came from and no one had ever tried to explore this battlefield before. So we're the first ones to go out there and not only take the text, but also take the archaeology to kind of tell the story of this battlefield, which is pretty, pretty cool. It's incredible. Americans are kind of doing things on their own. Um, you've probably heard sort of the myths that the Americans are shooting from the trees and sniping at the Redcoats and stuff like that. By this point in the Revolutionary War, that's not the case. Both sides are using skirmishers, more or less. See, it's hard to see from this angle, but you see a little bit of a rise up there on that hillside? Yeah. Yep. So that's like the German line coming in this general direction. Um, and then the American line was over here, roughly where this tree line is. We're gonna go to the other side. It's just easier to walk this path. Yeah, it's, it's not as swampy. mucky over there. But we're gonna go to, there's an overlook and then you'll be able to see the whole field. Yeah. It'll make awesome. sense. Yeah, so what you're gonna see as we walk by is we've mowed these transects, these lanes across the battlefield and they're mowed from north to south. Okay, and the reason for that is because we wanna find those two battle lines. That's really the research project here. You don't just dig holes or do projects. You always have a research question. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you make up the research question after you find stuff because it makes you look smarter that way. <laughs> but um, the research question for this, yeah, it's true, is uh, where were the battle lines? So we've laid those transects out across the battlefield that way. And as we detect a cross, we're gonna hopefully find musket balls in a line over here and musket balls in a line over there. We can tell a lot from musket balls like Paul was talking about. We're looking for things like had they been fired or not. Maybe some uh, uh, poor 15 year old kid was rushing when he was loading his weapon and dropped musket balls on the ground. So what we're doing on the site is called conflict archeology. span Conflict archeology. Conflict archeology. span um, And that's why we use metal detectors. Like we don't dig very much. We just do metal detector sweeps across the entire site. That lets us pick up the musket balls or the nails as you saw for yourself. Mm. And uh, the distribution patterns of those items across the battlefield, that's what tells what actually happened. So um, it might feel like you're just pulling up a nail or a musket ball or whatever case shot, but when you put all those things together on a map, you can pretty much tell the story of a German captain pulling his cannons across the line in order to reinforce his men and to fire more shot into the American lines. And you can kind of you can kind of get a sense of like these American soldiers, you know, fighting against the British who were the, the big dog in their day, uh, these guys had to be incredibly intimidated and incredibly terrified. So you get a sense of them, you know, ramming their shot down their barrels and shooting that off into the lines because you find those bullets in a line formation um, that they've either dropped or that they fired. So yeah, you can tell the story of the battlefield with this stuff. I, I was so interested in that because not only, I mean, and this is for people who might not even understand this, not only are you out there on the field finding this stuff, then you have to go through cleaning it, cataloging yeah. it, and that kind of stuff. And you were showing us, you know, like, you find musket balls that obviously have impacted something, you know, right. because they are, they are depressed, they have their oblong now, they, they, they hit a wall, or they hit a person maybe, or they hit something, and it, and, it, and it changed the shape of it. But then you found ones that are pristine, and like you said, that could literally be from somebody scared at shitless, trying yeah. to get their musket ball. Because it's hard, I mean, as, good of a technology as muskets were back in the day, it was very hard to load those things, especially quickly during war. Yeah, <laughs> so like we actually got a chance to go and fire muskets a couple of days ago with a local volunteer group. Oh, that which must have been cool. pretty cool as well. Um, but you know, all of our guys have like infantry backgrounds. All of us have fired guns before, like I grew up with guns myself, even though I'm Air Force. Um, so I've fired a lot of guns. Those are not easy guns to shoot. I mean, there are a lot of steps involved in making that thing work. And trying to do that while you're under fire, like, like I can't even imagine. But yeah, when you find that like musket ball that's completely pristine, 
it really makes you think like, wow, is this some like 15 year old kid that yeah. was just trying to like fire off another round as fast as he could and dropped it in place, you know, cause we find them in like lines. So we know that these guys are like lined up and they're firing, you know, obviously, you know, if you've seen pictures, you know, that's what they're doing, yeah, line, but you line find, line. you find yeah. these like unfired balls in a line and it's like, man, these guys must've just been the last person that touched this thing was probably in dire terror, the most terror they'd ever faced in yeah. their life. That was the last person to touch that before we did. And that's, that's pretty cool. That is cool. And it's cool how it tells the story of the battlefield too, because you guys are learning things that no one's known. We knew that the battlefield was there. We knew that the battle happened, but now that you're mapping it out, we're getting new insights into how that battle actually transpired, and that is exciting in and of itself. Yeah, and so the thing is, we don't actually know exactly where that battle occurred. Other so, than it's on the field. We knew it was in this area. In the area, yeah. yeah, but like the Park Service has basically come in and said, yeah, we think the battle was right here, so we're gonna cut the trees in this area to make it look battlefield-like. Mm. But really, we're not entirely sure about where that battle was out there. So probably some of those battle lines are in what are tree lines today. So we're actually metal detecting in the tree lines as well to catch those battle lines, because right now it's an approximation and that's what we hope to continue doing in the future too is revealing more what the battle actually looked like as opposed to you know what it kind of looks like right now it's so it, it's a different thing it's so cool and I, can you walk us through a little bit what um, we got to see out there you guys are some of the different tech that you're using because you we you are using the metal detectors, which yeah. I got to use the handheld one, which was really rad. Yeah. But you have other ones too, right? So actually, there's an incredible amount of tech. Like archaeology is so tech heavy right now. Like if you're thinking Indiana Jones archaeology out, you know, in the desert with pickaxes and shovels, like yeah, we do that too, and that's also fun. But that's not all it is now. So before we ever showed up, there was a drone that overflew the entire battlefield that shot science called LIDAR down into the into the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gave us like a super precise topo map. If you've ever seen some of the stuff being done in like Honduras to find lost cities, yep. same thing, because it doesn't show foliage, it shoots through it. Yep. So you can shoot through a forest and it gives you all the lumps and bumps on the ground. So that was done before we ever showed up. Wow. We show up out here, we do our, a uh, really precise metal detector survey in lanes that is laid on top of that topo map. So that gives us the distribution of the finds in those lanes. But then we also do what's called ground penetrating radar, um, where you run a cart across the battlefield and that picks up things like walls or uh, possibly graves. Um, although not in this case, but it'll pick up density differences in the ground. So all these things are being added in together to give us this extremely precise map of the battlefield to where we can read that story. Yeah. And yeah, you pull it right up and you want some gloves? Nah. Nah. Still in there. Yep. That was for chops. All right. Okay. So, it's like a little miniature yep. metal detector. Swing it around in there. Oh, a nail! Got a nail! Got a nail. Don't lie. <laughs> they don't. They just make it a really hard time. So, Joel, with everything we talked about this morning, I need your I need your wish list of things. Oh my God! Anything, I need your wish list of things for every day. We've got sometimes a nail. You, sometimes you need magnifying. I'm not kidding. The massage thing. You guys think I'm joking about it? It's gonna happen. <laughs> That I gave right you. Woo! Like what you found. Oh my god. Put that up to the camera. What is it? It's a nail. You got a nail? <laughs> Look to the left of the uh, barrel. Or the, uh, and then you're also um, cataloging the field as you're out there. It was really cool to see, like, you know, all of the different flags and everything. Can you talk a little bit about, like, how you were doing all that, too? Yeah. So, like, right now, if you go out to the battlefield and, and, probably not the case while this is airing, but right now it's completely covered in flags, orange, blue, and yellow flags, and those all mean different things. So every time my guys have a find, uh, they plant the flag to show where it is. If it's an iron find, they plant one color. If it's a metal or a lead find, they plant another. So if you look at those yellow flags, those are the ballistics, those are the musket balls. Yeah. And you can literally see just from looking out on the field right now where the patterns of yellow are, which is where those battle lines were back in the day. Uh, just by looking at those yellow flags. Wow, that is so cool. And then the other thing, I think you might have mentioned this too, but um, that was so interesting to me is you're walking around and you're you're GPSing this as you're doing it as well. Yeah, so we're also using essentially satellites to plot in exactly where these points are on the field. Uh, it was really cool last week because, so we bring in obviously disabled vets um, 
we had uh, a female officer, Air Force officer, who had been driving satellites during her career. So she literally was piloting satellites uh, while she was in the Air Force. And now she's carrying this GPS pole around and connecting to those same satellites in order to get points on the ground for these finds from 1777. So it was like a nice, you know, she's doing everything. She used to fly the satellites, and now she's using them on the ground to kind of see where this ancient battlefield was or this old battlefield was. Um, but yeah, we get really precise data for every single thing on the ground, and that's how we make those really precise maps. It, so it's it's really cool. You showed me like all the plot plotted points and everything, and you really do get to see like, wow, that's how the battle happened. Yeah. It's it, it really is, you know, and we're it's like so you're not just pulling stuff out of the ground, you're you're painting a picture from two hundred and fifty years ago. It's, yeah, no, and, and for us it's not even so much about the individual finds. I know like people watching are gonna say, like, what's the coolest thing you found? Because that's what we always hear. What's but the coolest thing you found? The coolest thing we found is uh, the battle lines. <laughs> 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 no, so the coolest thing we found is uh, yeah, the battle lines. And the house. Mm. I'll talk about the house here in a minute. Um but it's not so much about the individual finds, it's about the story that those line, or those finds kind of tell as a whole. Yeah. Um, Cause if you come to like our lab, you'll see like, oh, we've got a bunch of musket balls and whatnot. And again, like if you just look at them, you're like, well, that's a, that's a lead ball, but it's what numerous lead balls tell us about how this battle occurred. That's, that's what we're really kind of interested in. It's, it's so, so interesting. And yeah, you, you just mentioned it. Um, we know that on this battlefield, there existed at one point a house and you think that you might have found it. Yeah, so the house is important because the house basically anchored part of the German battle line. The Germans were fighting for the British. So if we can find that house, we kind of know where that battle line was. And we know that that's where they were putting some of their ordnance, some of their cannons. And that would be the one thing from this battle, this this fairly short one hour battle that we would really still be able to find on the ground with kind of normal archaeological techniques like excavation and stuff. Right. And yeah, through the geophysical survey, we think we've got it. Uh, it's something that we're looking to come back and dig in the future, um, hopefully next year. So we're looking to actually like excavate some on this site to, to see what's down there. That is so exciting. And it's really exciting. Like I've said this, I was saying this to you, like I grew up in this area. So, you know, there was many school field trips uh, that were taken to the Saratoga battlefield, you know, and I never knew that no one had really taken the time to do what you're doing before yeah. here. That's that it's, it's so interesting that you guys are doing it and able to find what you guys are finding. The the other question I kind of had was it, do you you're find you're doing metal work right now, you know, metal detection and, and really finding the ordnance and finding a lot of nails <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Well, you're you're finding Yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, exactly. Um but um if you were to do traditional like excavation, would you find bones? So very possibly, like we, we don't try out there to find human remains, mm -hmm. but if we did find human remains and we did need to excavate, we would, we would do the normal archeological excavation. But yeah, there are probably human remains out on that battlefield. And that's why we really emphasize to everyone that like that's hallowed ground for us. There are probably quite a few human burials that we're working around out there. So, you know, every time we hear a beep or a buzz through those metal detectors, like, we do remember that those are real people down there that we're kind of working around. But yeah, there are probably there are probably burials on that site. Wow, that is that's so so interesting. Archaeology as a whole, I think, is just so interesting, and it was so cool to see it in action for real. Like you know, because I've obviously I've seen Indiana Jones and I've seen Jurassic right. Park and stuff like that. You know, but like to see it to see you guys out there doing it, it was it was just amazing. And I kind of want to hear your story because like you mentioned, you um, were in the Air Force and uh, thank you very much for your service, by the way. And you know, you're mi with your military background, how do you go from that to archeology? span Yeah, so I was always better when I was in the Air Force at taking care of my troops. Like I was an aircraft maintenance officer, um, but I wasn't one of those tech head guys that was kind of like out making cars and stuff like that in my spare time. Uh, but I love taking care of my guys. And I always had like 50 to 100 that I was kind of in charge of um, at a pretty, pretty young age, I guess. And so I got out and I was actually going to go back in as a chaplain because that's what I was good at. So I got out and I was going to go back and get the, the MDiv degree that you need to be a chaplain. Yep. And while I was doing that MDiv, I happened to go on a dig in Israel. I knew nothing about archaeology. I'd never been interested in it before. I had a bachelor's degree in history, but archaeology just looked boring to me. Um, if you've ever looked at like archaeology reports, they just look fucking dull. It's just a lot of black and white pictures that don't mean anything at all. So I went out there because I wanted to go see Israel. I just wanted to travel. And as soon as I started digging, I was just like, fuck, this is like the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. Like, 
it's endlessly fascinating. I tell people like I could just dig dirt all day with nothing in it and I'd be, you know, I'd be ecstatic because to me it's just endlessly fascinating. So as soon as I started doing that, I just switched everything over, switched out of the MDiv and became an archeologist, went through a couple of master's programs and uh, then a PhD in archeology span because I was trying to never have a job. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, during the course of that PhD, um, we started developing this veterans program where we could put veterans on archaeology digs. And that really tied in those two things together where I was able to take care of my guys and do the archaeology at the same time. Because um, what you realize, I think, when you're out in the field too, like if you've seen Indiana Jones, you think, oh, archaeology is like one random guy in a crazy hat and a whip, like off having crazy adventures someplace around the world. Archaeology is like an adult team sport. Like basically the head archaeologists give you the mission and then a team of people accomplish that mission. Everyone's doing their own things, but it all comes together to like be bigger than the sum of its parts, so yeah. to speak. It's kind of like a cross between summer camp and football for adults. Um, and that's how it actually works. And as soon as I started doing it, even when I was in my MA, I was like, wow, this feels like a deployment. This feels like a training mission. Um, this feels like the military did. Wow. So like through the course of the PhD, we were like, you know, why don't we just start putting veterans on these American veterans on archaeology digs? And it just sort of kept growing and growing. And um, there are a couple of British organizations that do something similar to this. So we kind of work with them to get their best practices and share ours with them as well. But Is this, are you the only American? We are the only American uh, nonprofit or for profit or anything that does this. We're the only game in town when it comes to putting veterans on archaeology wow. digs um, and also moving them through because we don't just. One of our big things is we don't just put veterans on one dig. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make a community out of those veterans and move them forward. So if they want to become an archeologist, we're gonna help them to do that by putting them on multiple digs that are kind of specific to their area of interest. Wow. If they don't wanna become an archeologist, which is totally fine, then they come out of this learning something new and with a bunch of new friends because inevitably these people will bond together. Like yeah. last night, these guys have known each other for two weeks, these guys that we have out in this field right now, two weeks total and you would swear that they're family. They're just wow. bullshitting around the fireplace. Uh, Nicole and I, my COO and I, like walked out. We've got a little overlook in the house that we're all staying in together. We just heard them like giggling from upstairs. We were working on some stuff and we heard all these giggles and we walked down there and we looked over the overlook and these guys were all just like sitting around playing cards against humanity. And I mean, it was like, for one thing, terribly offensive to anyone with sensibilities, oh, yeah. which is cards against humanity game. is. Everybody does, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, everybody loves that game. but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, these guys looked like they'd been buddies for like years and they just met each other. So, wow. you know, we use archaeology to make that happen though, because they go out in the field, they work together toward this mission, just like they did in the military. They get tired, you know, they sweat together, they see that they can count on each other. And after just a couple of weeks, they're, they're tight, you know, and that's what we want to see. So yeah, it's about making archaeologists, but it's also about making those, those buddies so that, you know, a couple of years from now, after the long after the dig is over, if one of them's having a problem, we want them to be like, you know what, I could rely on you know, so-and-so out in the field, I'm going to give them a call. That's um, So that's what we're really trying to do with it. We think archaeology can do a lot more than it's doing right now. That's incredible. So American Veteran Archaeology Recovery, ABAR, um, and you guys started in 2016. Right. Was it hard to get this off the ground, an idea like this? Because it seems, it seems like such a great idea, but it's also very new, it seems. It's like. very new, yeah. And so at first, it, it is really hard. And also, we wanted to be sure that we were doing it right before we got big because we're taking veterans out there who do have disability ratings in most cases and who are really putting a lot of trust in us. You know, we're saying like, hey, this is gonna help you. You're gonna make friends on this. And that's a that's a that's an obligation that we feel on our part to actually make this work for them. So we knew we had a really strong idea, but we wanted to uh, get the experience and kind of get our feet wet a little bit before we started doing like 20 person digs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for the first couple of years, we're just doing small projects, you know, three or four or five veterans on a dig here, three or four or five veterans on a dig there. Uh, we did a little work overseas, which was really cool. But um, it really wasn't until last year when we got funding from National Geographic, wow. where uh, they put a lot of faith in us and funded a project for us. And that's when we were kind of like, you know what, we, we got this now, we understand what we're doing. We're still learning all the time. That's incredible. Uh, we're getting better every day. But um, that's when I think we really felt our feet kind of underneath us. And this project's been awesome. Like the Saratoga community has just really kind of rallied around us. We've had you guys out to the site, obviously, but you know, everyone has shown a lot of interest and really helped us out with a lot of community support. So now we kind of feel like we have something going forward that is solid. Like yeah. now we feel like if a veteran calls us, we can be like, yeah, this is what we can do for you. We got your back, come out and do a dig with us. It's going to be awesome. And we don't care if they like or know about archeology span beforehand. Like our thing is 
if you really have no idea how archaeology works or have never thought about being an archaeologist before, if you've been in the military, this will feel familiar to you. If you miss the military, come out and dig with us, man, because it's going to feel the same. That's really, really interesting. And also, are you all always on battle sites on digs? No. So one of the things we've been looking at is like how the site impacts the participant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were just on a dig in Israel a month ago out in kind of a remote environment out in the middle of nowhere. You could like hear the jackals howling at night and shit. We were all camping out there in Israel with a veteran team. Wow. Um, so that was really cool. Um, when the guys weren't on the dig site, they were like crawling through uh, tunnels and caves that had been dug by Jewish rebels in the second century. So, you know, it's just, it's an incredible adventure. So that worked really, really well. The battlefield sites worked really well because they can understand that. Like, right. It's something that they can relate to. They've been there before. So we try to, we try to do stuff that the guys are interested in. Like I have my own academic, you know, whatevers. And so do a lot of academics, but we try to pick stuff that they want to do. So like, if they want to dig a Viking site, we're going to try to give them a Viking site. If they yeah. want to dig up a Sam Samurai household, we're gonna put them on a samurai household. We, we want them to do stuff that they think is fucking cool. That is so cool. And you brought up the, the dig in Israel, and, and one of the things that I thought was absolutely incredible that you told us when we went out to visit you guys is um, you had veterans from there working side by side, right? From, from Israel. Yeah, yeah. And that's incredible. Like yeah, making those bonds. Yeah, so one of the cool things about Israel that's different than the states is that they have compulsory military service. Everybody served for a little while. Yeah. So and everybody gets it. I mean, this dig site we were on was a couple of miles away from the wall, the Gaza Strip wall, yeah. so we could see it. Um, we were actually in a, a, a IDF for Israeli Defense Force like training area. The only reason we were able to go in there was because they were out of there for Passover. So we went in and did the job and pulled out. But yeah, we're working alongside Israeli vets who have done their compulsory service, who are in this kind of unique environment, but then they've moved on and are now doing something else. So what we find is like the Israeli vets don't talk about their military service as much as the Americans do. It's yeah. not as big of a thing for them and their identity. So, you know, the Americans, sometimes you'll have someone that's just like, you know, 15 years ago, I was an NCO. It's the coolest thing I ever did. I'm gonna talk about it all the time. And that's where I stopped. You know, I was a tip of the spear operator, but now I'm on disability, so I sleep on my couch. Right. With the Israelis, they're like, yeah, I did my two years. I fought in this war and this war. Now I'm off, you know, running this shop or I'm off being an archeologist or whatever. It's not a big deal to them. Wow. And it's kind of a, I think for some of our guys that go out there, it's a neat thing to see that these guys have also been in the shit but they just, you know, that's not what defines them. They get past that. Yeah. That's what we want our guys to do. We don't want our guys to, what we, what we tell our guys is, you used to be a badass. Yeah. We're gonna make you a badass again. We're gonna take you and give you something fucking cool that you never thought you could do. You can go off and have these amazing adventures that you wanted to have. You can have those again. That's what we're trying to do, that transition with it, them. It's, it's so inspiring what you're doing because it's not just, here's some busy work to get your mind off of yeah. what's hurting you, you yeah. know? Because you work with wounded vets, you work with active military, you work with people who are dealing with a lot of different things. And and it's not just, you know, here, dig a hole. Go dig a hole, you yeah. know, like, or, or whatever. You're giving them actual skill sets and, and, and teaching them all along the road. One of the things you told me that I'm just so excited about is you said you have a girl that's been working with you since the beginning, since 2016, and you guys are gonna fund her on her own dig. Yeah, so we have a we have a tier system because there are a lot of programs out there, veteran programs that like put veterans on like a two week retreat or a one week hunting excavation or expedition or a scuba trip or something like that. And those are great. Like mm -hmm. I'm not oh, yeah, you know, totally. shit talking those guys. If, if the vets are into that stuff, then let them do it. That's cool. Um, and I'm definitely up for vets using their benefits. But what we want to try to do is move them past being dependent on us. We ideally they work with us a few times and then they can go off and be, you know, amateur archaeologists or professional archaeologists and have these adventures for the rest of their lives. And that way we can keep bringing new people in and using, you know, our funding to the max. So, yeah, we have this tier system. Um, this woman is an Army veteran, uh, retired out of the Army after 22 years of service. Wow. Um, she's worked with us on a couple of projects since the very beginning. She was on our first project in 2016. She knows the field now. She's not a professional archaeologist, but she knows it well enough to get along with the team. Mm -hmm. uh, she knows what she's doing. She's an asset on the site. And so because she's interested in sort of Old Testament archaeology, biblical archaeology, as some people would call it, she wanted to dig Iron Age Israel. Wow. So we hooked her up with a dig in Iron Age Israel. She's about to go on that in about a week and a half now. 
we fund that. Like she's basically getting a scholarship through us to go off and have this adventure and be able to engage in exactly what she wants to do. But now she doesn't have an AVAR support team around her. It's just her and that dig team. And she's off doing her thing and kicking ass by herself. And that's what we want to see. We want them to go off and kick ass without needing any kind of a support network around them anymore. It's so, so cool. So inspiring. Well, I, I, I just, my eyes are open to it now. And I never knew that archaeology could have so many different applications other than literally digging a hole in the ground. You know what I mean? And it's just so, it's so inspiring and, and, and amazing. And I'm sure, you know, in just the last few years, seeing this grow from your perspective is just amazing as well. It is, yeah. Like, um, I don't know if this, this happened to y'all at all, but it's really crazy for me to see like the logo that this logo that I came up with while I was panicking in the middle of my PhD at like two in the morning when I was just like, ah, I gotta have something that'll work. It's really crazy that I see this like on stuff now um, and people have seen what this logo is and kind of remember our name, which again is something that I, we were almost Avast, believe it or not. I can't remember what the acronym was gonna stand for instead of AVAR. Avast. Avast, <laughs> but everyone was like, oh, everyone's gonna think you guys are pirates. <laughs> it's true. So we put a lot of thought into it, right? But now it's kind of weird for that name to start getting out there and people to start kind of recognizing, oh, AVAR, yeah, I've heard of yeah. you guys. Like in the archeological community, like in America, people are like, oh yeah, I've heard of this veteran group. That's pretty cool. That and is... it's weird because at first we were just like fighting tooth and nail for someone to be, you know, people were like, why are you putting veterans on digs? Why, why does the military need to dig? And we were trying to tell them like, no, it's really good for them. Plus they're awesome archeologists because they work really hard. Yeah. Like, like these guys are good at this. So we were like tearing our hair out, trying to get this idea across for a while. And now it's starting to catch. And that's really fucking cool. That is so fucking cool. Um, and that brings me to the question I get to all the time. And I really am curious. Through, through your journey from the military to getting your PhD in archaeology to ha to starting AVAR and all, everything everything in between, what fuels you to keep going? What fuels you to keep doing this? Well, now that Death Wish Coffee is helping, I gotta I gotta give you guys a. That's a totally legitimate plug, by the way, because like I I drink a lot of caffeine and your stuff is good, and yeah, I I well thank will you. Keep drinking that, but it's really my guys. Um, it really is. Like archaeology is great. I enjoy it, obviously. I, you know, I got the PhD and everything, so I've ticked that box, um, and I do love it. But what it's all about for me is helping my troops. That's what I believed in when I was in the service. That's my duty. That's my obligation for the rest of my life. That will not go away. And you know, Nicole and I, again, my COO and I had these conversations because she was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. I was a captain uh, in the Air Force. Some of these guys are assholes. Like if you've met veterans before, they're not all nice people, and yeah. the ones that need help the most tend to not be or be the least nice of the veterans. Right. So it's not that we like these guys or that we're out there, you know, working with our buddies. It's that it's our duty to take care of these people. These are our family. And so they're the ones that keep us going. Like as long as these vets need help, we're going to be doing this to help them. If this stops working, then we're going to be in a soup kitchen someplace serving vets. Whatever helps those guys is what we're going to do. That's so, so cool. Um, I, I, this is a perfect time to then ask is uh, you guys get you guys are a nonprofit organization and I mean it was awesome that you're getting you know recognition from like National Geographic now and stuff like that but you rely heavily on donations correct yeah yeah so like this year's projects were uh, funded by the Blake and Bailey Family Foundation which was awesome they came through at the very last minute when we were just like hey can we we got to make this we got to make this work and they really hooked us up um, the American Battlefield Trust also gave us a really nice grant for the for this project at Saratoga but Nicole and I, none of our staff take a paycheck. Like we believe this works. Um, so every dollar that people give to us goes straight back into putting these veterans on the site um, and to keeping them happy while they're out here. Cause they get like, I mean, they get a nice experience. We're taking them to museums. Um, they eat well, sometimes too well. My shirts have all gotten a lot tighter <laughs> since I got out here. That's great. Um, but yeah, if folks want to donate, they can do so either through our website or our Facebook page. And any of our listeners or our viewers, they can go right to your, your website. And, right to and our donate, website. Yeah, there's, right a, there. there's a donation page on the website. We would love to take those in. And I can assure them that all those dollars, I mean, we stretch them to the max. Like we did an entire, uh, you know, fairly significant dig at Saratoga for a very, very low figure compared to what others would have done so because we you know we leverage local donations and people really help us out and the veterans work incredibly hard so we bring in kind of a smaller team so you know, we really do stretch those dollars to the limit nicole you know if you want to get something done for nothing bring in a marine because that's what they're good at <laughs> and she just can make things happen so that's yeah awesome. those dollars will go to work that's awesome well i'll put links for that all that in this show as well uh speaking of you know successfully like getting you know recognition from like national geographic and stuff like that what was that project that national geographic was 
interested in. Yeah, so National Geographic funded a project on a shaker site in New York. It's actually like an hour and a half away from here, I think, uh, which is pretty cool. Like, we didn't realize that we were going to be doing two projects so close to each other, but that put uh, 13 veterans on uh, that dig for about three weeks last year. Wow. Which was a, co- a pretty cool project, all living together again, all working the site. So, yeah, that was a cool one as well. What but, were you excavating? It was a shaker. Uh, it was a shaker house. So a we house. were interested in sort of like uh, how the shakers were living, basically. So uh, shakers are kind of seen as being pretty. Uh, um, what's the word for it? Abstinent teetotal types, like yeah. stuck up types. I yeah. think would be a good characterization. Yep. So basically, we were kind of looking to see if that was true, to see if we could find like the beer bottles in the cellar and stuff like that, which we did find a few of. So <laughs> uh, we were trying to, yeah, find out their dirty little secrets and whatnot, which is what archaeology is pretty good at doing. That is so exciting, and it's really exciting. Again, bringing a full circle back to what you're doing on the battlefield, and because you know, even from this area, Saratoga. When I tell people I'm from Saratoga, more often than not in normal conversation, either people say, I have no idea where that is, <laughs> or, because I usually have to say, oh, it's near Albany, New York, you yeah. know, like that gives them some sort of reference, or they go, oh yeah, you got horses up there, don't you? Yeah. Because of the horse track. It's a shame that the first thing on everybody's lips is an, oh, that's the turning point of the Revolutionary War, because yeah. it is, the Battle of Saratoga. I mean, obviously I learned about that in school because I was from this area, but I mean, everybody learns about that in school, but you forget about it, because you learn about it in fourth grade, and yeah. it's over. I really think it would be incredible if you guys are able to continue to work here and hopefully get some sort of larger recognition. I mean, it would be amazing to see your finds on like a, a special on National Geographic or something. Yeah, so that's kind of the plan. We really want to be here for a long period of time. And not only because the community has been great, but also just because this is such a good site. And like the partnerships we had with the archaeologists that work out there with us and the National Park Service were so positive and they have such cool ideas about kind of like how to make this like a digital display, how to like make this really appealing to people that want to come in. I think all of us want everyone that comes to that park to be blown away by what we found, the quality of the displays. You know, we want them to get a sense for how this happened and we know we can do that better. Um, So yeah, I think we're all on the same page with that. We want to be here for a long time working and making this incredible. That's awesome. I can't wait to see what else you guys are going to find because there's so much we don't know about what actually happened there. You know, we know the outcome. Obviously, we're sitting here <laughs> yeah. and we're not British. Uh, we know the outcome, but it, it's so cool to, to start to really put those pieces together. And I tell people a lot when they come to this area and anybody that's listening or watching, if you ever can make it to Saratoga Springs, New York, um, so much emphasis is on our horse racing, is on our, you know, performing arts center, is on our that type of stuff. And I always tell people, like, you need to go to the, Nas- the Saratoga National Park. You need to check out the battlefield. It's not only gorgeous it's a gorgeous park but yeah. it is so rich with history you feel it yeah. just walking on those fields you feel the conflict you feel the the weight of really what went down there yeah you really can and we're actually so excited about it that our plan for next year is to camp on the battlefield on wow. one of the actual sites out there for the entire time that we're doing the project so you know hopefully uh, tick and mosquito season aren't uh, yeah. uh, aren't going on at that time but yeah because it's just it's just cool like why wouldn't you camp on a battlefield if you had the opportunity to and because of this really unique opportunity that we have with the National Park Service we get to do that yeah like because you normally normally by the way I should add in like you can't metal detect on a battlefield. no not at all yeah. that is a federal crime yes so um, the stuff that we're allowed to do through the National Park Service and on this specific site, like this is a once in a lifetime type of opportunity. It's incredible. I, I'm so excited that it's happening and I'm so excited that an organization like yours actually exists and is doing so much good and I can't wait to see even more stuff that you're doing and I can guarantee that we're going to keep you caffeinated on other digs because I just meeting a lot of the guys that were out there, you're right. These guys are some of the hardest working guys because they're ex-military or they're current yeah. military, you know? That's all they know is, is to work hard and do a good job at what they're doing. And I want to keep them caffeinated to do that. Yeah, well, believe me, I would be happy for you guys to, like, our guys don't stop. Like, you, cannot, did, I you know. cannot make them get out of the field. They do not take breaks. So, yeah, we're working we're working long days out there, so it helps. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me because it's so interesting. And I'm sure we will be checking in with you in the future about other digs and hopefully when you get to come back and uh, dig again on the battlefield. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to keep you guys up to date. Thanks for having me. Awesome. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Deathwish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.